but for the love that God was showing me. And so this evening I want to tell you two things. What's truth and what's fact? Because sometimes we can mix up the truth with the facts. And we can take the truth, we can take the facts and make giants out of the facts. And then we have to ask ourselves, what is the truth? And the facts are looming high and they're just everywhere. They're loud, they're shouting, they're, they're crowding you out. Your thoughts can't think of anything else but the facts. The facts is my daughter is homeless. The facts are my little three grandchildren are hurting. The facts are that I can't help them anymore. But what is the truth? Jesus. God is our provider. He is the one that is, he is the one that's doing everything. Yes. I, he was using me to help my children. Now he is a, there's a lesson for me in that. That lesson is telling me to look to him. Amen. Not because I had some money in the bank. Not because I feel I have the right words to say to them. Not because I am the mother and the grandmother. None of those reasons. God want me to see him. Yes. See him through the pain. He want me to see him through everything that I do. Nothing. Nothing. No exception. And scripture came to me. And this is how, how I read the scripture. And you all know the scripture very well. It's John 3, 16 and 17. And this is how I read it. For God so loved Anne that he gave his only begotten son for Anne that whoever and I am, I'm a whoever, believes in him. I, I shall not perish, but have eternal life. He said in 17, for God sent not his son to Anne, to condemn Anne, but to save Anne through him. I would like you to put your name there. And I would like you to say that because if you were the only person on this earth, God would have come for you. He would have loved you the same way. Let it just blaze into your minds the tremendous love he had. And when I held that little baby and I feel my love for that baby, and God allowed me to feel his love and comfort at that time, it's no comparison. It's no comparison. Those verses are truth. That is truth. You live by that against the facts. So when the tears were full flowing, and I know what the facts are, God told me who he was and the truth gave me comfort. The truth made me feel, oh, I can get up and do whatever I want to do. I don't have to sit here and move around. I don't have to do all of this because the truth sets us free, doesn't it? Yes. So we're going to look at a story about truth and facts. And we all got it in our lives. We got truth because truth is God. And we got facts because we live our daily lives with our husbands, our children, our co-workers, our neighbors, our friends. We have a lot of facts in our lives. We're touched in so many, many ways, some of us more than others. But we're going to read in this story, and we can turn to Numbers 13. 
And we'll start in verse 1. And the Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. I am giving, giving, underline, underscore, giving. That is truth, because God said so. But we're going to skip the names of all the people, and we're going to drop down to verse 17. When Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, Go up through the Negev and on the hill country. See what the land is like and see whether the people who live there are strong or weak. Few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees on it? You know you got to look for trees because in the desert there were no trees. So we want to know if there were something. Well, how fruitful is this land? Do your best, in other words, to bring back some of the fruit of the land. It was a season for the first ripe grapes. In other words, he was telling them, get a full picture of what God is giving us. You know it has got to be good because it's God giving us. He always give us good gifts. Moses could have well been saying, we can know better the heart of our good God that brought us out of our burdensome life in Egypt by just looking at what he has done for us. It's like presents. You're excited to open the package and see what's inside. We haven't seen any in a long time. The trees were, I don't know, unless they came across an oasis, there were no trees. So when, in verse 21, so they went up and explored the land from the desert of Zin as far as Rehob towards Lino Hamath. They went up through the native and came to the Hebron where Ahiman, Shishai, and Talmai the descendants of Anak lived. These giants had an impact on the ten, on ten of the spies. Caleb and Joshua saw differently. You know any Caleb's and Joshua's? Are you a Caleb and a Joshua? Or are you one of the spies? God wants us to see him even though there are giants in our lives. We could only do that if we know who we are. What does a grasshopper got doing looking at God? And I don't know who God is. I don't even hear. I don't even talk. I don't hear. I don't. I just flap my wings and hop around. That's a grasshopper. In verse 23, when they reached the valley of Eshcol, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole between them along with some pomegranates and fruit. More proof of what God was like. A God of more than enough. Matter of fact, the only, they shouldn't even have to go into the land of Canaan. God says so, you know it got to be flown with, land, with milk and honey because he says so. But there are other reasons why they needed to go. At the end, in verse 25, at the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. They came, in verse 26, they came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They showed them, they showed them what they brought back. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. <laughs> Proof positive of what God had said. In other words, it was the truth. That should have been the end of the story, shouldn't it? But the overriding thoughts that they created from the facts made them grasshoppers. Verse 28, but the people who lived there, 
You see, they, 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 they said this is what it was. Flowing with Lionel, Mike, milk and honey, and they had the grapes as evidence. But you remember last year was Pastor, oh, what's his name though? Talk about the big butt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, this is a big butt right here. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We saw descendants of Anak there, warfares. They insist in telling their story. They insisted in telling this story. Their story, not the story, but their story. These spies had taken complete control of their own thoughts and forgot that God said the land was theirs. How many times we forgot what Jesus has done for us. We forget it daily because you know why? The actions that we do say that we don't remember what Jesus is saying to us. So that make us grasshoppers. But I'm here to tell you, I am not a grasshopper and you are not either. Take a moment to look inwardly. Look in yourself. What do you see with all the trials and hardships? With all that is going on in the world, what or who do you see? Do the facts control you? Are they bigger than your God? Or should, if they are, then we can make that a small g. Because in our world, when facts control, it's the idolatry. It's what, who we worship that has the last say. And that definitely is not my God. My capital G God. That's a small G God. In verse 30, then Caleb silenced the people. Out of all these people, millions of these people, this come this lone voice. Silence the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land. Bam, done. That's it. No argument, that's it. Why? Why was he so certain? Why was Caleb so confident? They all saw the same thing. They based those facts of Canaan from the, they, Caleb and Joshua, based their facts from the truth of God, what God said. Other parts of the Bible, we see people face facts, but through the lens of God. David is one such person. He faced Goliath even though he was ridiculed. You know, his brothers, go away from here, little squirt. You know, go somewhere else. This is for the men. The men are fighting. Did you see that, Goliath? Did you see that giant? What do you think you can do here? His brothers and other, part, other parts, people in the army. All the facts said to David, but the, all the facts said no to David, but the truth of the matter was always God. David thought that even if Goliath was as tall as the trees, he still was only a shrub to God, or less than that. And that's where his strength came from. He remembered the days of fighting lions and bears with his bare hand, and God is the one he attributed his victory to. So this giant, as they call him, is not really frightening to me. Why? Because God is the one fighting the battle. And he, matter of fact, even got so upset 
Who do you think you are, uncircumcised fella? That you want to go up against the armies of God. Not Saul's armies. Not the Israelite people. Not David. But the armies of God. David knew the truth. Do we have that truth? <coughs> Another person was Paul. Paul in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 1, 8, Paul said, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, believers, believers, that's what he's talking to, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure far beyond our ability, our ability to endure that we begin to despair of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But this all happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God. And if you look in, uh, go back up to the chapter and look in verse 2, what he was saying is not just God, but he emphasized God, our Father. So if he is our Father, then who am I? That's right. And then, then he added on to, to that, that we despair, the, the sentence of death. He said, then he tapped on who God our Father, who raises the dead. So in other words, even if it was death, it's okay, because we're still trusting in him. Paul says these facts, but they didn't obscure God from his sight. He knew who he was. At some time or other, we face some of these same facts of life. Paul saw in his weakness, in his inability, the ability of God. Not I that live, but Christ. And in verse 31, go back to the men. But the men who had gone up with them said, hold on a minute. Didn't I just tell you that the doctor said blah, 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 and I only got six months to live? Didn't I just tell you that my bank account is overdrawn? Didn't I just tell you that I am depressed over all these things? We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. They are giants. Look at us, grasshoppers. Sure, all these are facts. They are stronger than us. But it is not us, but Christ. We are never, never, ever alone. What happens when we forget that? We do what these spies did. We see our own stupid thoughts telling us who we are. And, and matter of fact, they went even as far as saying, not only do we see ourselves in, 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 the, in our own eyes as grasshoppers, but other people see us too. Who tell them that? <laughs> How did you know what you think? I might think I'm a grasshopper, but I don't know if you think I'm a grasshopper. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, that's what flawed thoughts do. That's what that's why we are we, we are admonished to bring every thought, the good and the bad, into subjection. Because sometimes the good ones can get you going off in a different way too. Amen. What happens when we forgot forget we do what these spies did? Spread the same fears and emphasize the facts, emphasize the fact. Did you see that one giant? He was 20 feet tall. Make giants out of every issue in our lives. 
every single issue becomes a giant something that we can't even see over that we can't fight that we don't have the arm matter of fact what david did saul gave him armor and david said i can't wear this thing <laughs> because see what what david was saying it isn't my armor that's going to fight him it was god we forget who we are and who is able we forget that we are in Christ the author and the finisher of our lives he is going to finish or what he has begun he has begun a good work in us do you believe that yes, yes. yes. <laughs> you remember the three Israelitish boys they say oh King Nebuchadnezzar even if you get that fire as hard as you could to burn me up, we still ain't bowing down to your gods. Amen. Even if you throw us in that fire, no, we pass. We have a mighty God. We have a God that is able. For our God is able. And to add to that, even if God doesn't save us from you, we still are not bowing to anyone but the God of Israel. You got to know who you are to speak to the king like that. King Nebuchadnezzar had a lot of power. We well, see what he was going to do, throw them into the fire. So to speak to the king like that, you have to know who you are. Amen. In our lives, to speak to our giants, we have to know who we are. In verse 32, and they spread, oh, this is what they did. They spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said the land we explored devours those who live in it. How did they know that? <laughs> did they see anybody get eaten up? They all came back. All the people we saw were of great size. What does size compare to God have to do with it? You just witnessed crossing the Red Sea. A cloud that keeps you from burning up in the, day, in the daytime. A fire that keeps you warm at night. You had food from heaven that had all the nutrition in it to take care of your body. You had clothes that didn't wore out. You had shoes that didn't need a cobbler. What does the Nephilim, the Anna, have to do with anything? They are facts, not truth. In verse 33, we saw the Nephilim there. We seem like, this is where it is. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we look the same to them. Who told them that? <laughs> you see what not knowing who you are can do? Not only destroy you, but it also destroys others around you. It infects people. It makes them second guess who they are. And if they're not strong on their feet, they can topple them over. Do you see? Moses chose leaders, leaders that help him with managing of all such a vast amount of people. Every one of us here is a leader in some way. What report are you giving to those around you? Caleb and Joshua got the truth. It is not us, but God. Caleb saw the truth. David saw the truth. Paul saw the truth. They all are saying, this is what they're saying. I can do all things through Christ that strengthen me. If God is for me, who can be against me? We have to ask God to destroy the giants that fill our minds. 
Bring every thought into subjection to God. In other words, let this mind be in you. The mind of Christ. You can do it because it's not you, but Christ in union with you. You can do it. Yeah. There's one man I was talking to Pastor T about some of this subject a few weeks back, and he sent an email to me. His, ma his name is Oswald Chambers. Oswald Chambers was Os Oswald Chambers was an early 20th century Scottish Baptist and Holiness movement evangelist and teacher. That's a mouthful. <laughs> Best known for his devotional, I am sure everybody heard of that, my utmost for his highest. He was born July 24th, 1874, and he died November 15, 1917, in Cairo. And this is what he said. If we are to be disciples of Jesus, we must be made disciples supernaturally. And as long as we consciously maintain the determined purpose to be his disciples, we can be sure that we are not his disciples. If you think you're doing it yourself, then you somebody else's disciple, but you're not God's. <laughs> We can be sure, Jesus says, this is what he quoted in John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Is there any getting around that? So who are you? How can you see the truth through the facts? This is the way the grace of God begins. It is a constraint we can never escape. We can disobey it, and we all have, but we can never start it or produce it. We are drawn to God by a work of his supernatural grace, and we can never trace back to find where the work began. You, you know when God start working with you? <laughs> Before the universe began. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Our Lord's making of a disciple is supernatural. He does not build on any natural capacity of ours at all. God does not ask us to do things that are naturally easy for us. He only asks us to do things that we are perfectly fitted for. That's, he knows what we are perfectly fitted for. We don't. He only asks us to do things that we are perfectly fitted to do through his grace. And that is where the cross we must bear always come. To me, this is the good news. It calls us from hopping around like grasshoppers to rest in Jesus. That's what God is calling us, to a rest from all the who, here, there, and everywhere. Don't know. Running like a chicken with a head cut off. <laughs> all over the place. That's right. All over the place. Don't know. Don't know who we are. Everybody that said, huh, you listen. And they go over there and say, no. You listen. Everyone, it's, it's all right, it's all right to listen. But what I'm talking about, it doesn't, you can listen to somebody, but it doesn't change who you are. It doesn't change your identity in Christ. You, we are children of the most high God. There's no higher honor than that. You have been drawn by God. What report, what report do you have? What did God say? He has prepared a place for you. He loves you. He have in his arms, he have you in his arms. You are his children. Go, take the land. It's flowing with milk and honey. It's yours. 
And I'll end with this. May the grace of God fill our hearts as we share this good news with all that we meet. Amen. Amen. Amen.